Hey Tyler, how are you? Jamal, Nada, Kelly, how are you guys doing? Hey, um, DBQs, maybe from you guys. Uh, I would like to grade what you can do. Uh, it'll greatly help. All right. Uh, Jackie, hi, how are you doing today? How many slides today, Klaus? I don't know, Joa. Just deal with it. It's okay. I'm learning you. All right. You will be fine. I promise. Hey, Luke, Jonathan, Nicholas, how are you guys doing today? Nice to see you, Samaya. Uh, I'm assuming you might be a Mr. Peterson student. Uh, Brendan, Bavesh, Osahan, uh, Carlisle, how are you doing? I wish I got as many views on my uh, videos on uh, YouTube as you get, Carlisle, that's for sure. Uh, Bishnu, Caden. How are you guys? The people want to know how many slides there are. Well, right now, uh, Joa, this is a dictatorship, and I don't have to tell you, so you just accept it. All right. Hey, Monica, how are you? Mega, Mega Clinton, how are you? Hey, Lily, how are you? Yes, onward to Unit 4 already. Mark, good afternoon. It's good to see you guys coming into this. For those of you who have not yet turned anything in for uh, the DBQ session that we did on Monday, please, please turn it in, and I'll I turn those around pretty darn fast. So I would like to I would like you to know where you're sitting with that. Um, I've been slacking off this week. Am big tired. Tired from what? You're doing nothing. All right. Wait, can you rebel against Klaus? Nope. No rebellions. I have a force that is stronger than what you can ever muster there, buddy. So don't worry about it. Wyatt, I'm sorry I've let you down. What does that even mean, Joa? Hey, Kevin, how are you? Long time no here, right? Uh, from Monday Zoom lecture, yeah. <clears throat> stress, stress. What kind of stress do you have? You have about as much stress as I do right now. So... Hey, Jace, how are you doing? <laughs> That's right. I have 231 subscribers. Hey, Elaine, how are you? Uh, yeah, I would do that, Bishnu, uh, just for the fact uh, she gives you some pretty good information about the AP administration. Uh, I think it's very, very important that you go to one of her uh, Zoom meetings. Um, so please do. I'm doing good, Bavesh. How are you? Hey, Faith, how are you? Three PowerPoints, Joa. That's what it is. White Lotus Rebellion. What can you tell me about that, Lily? What can you tell me about the White Lotus Rebellion? You know, Carlisle has more, uh, more uh, subscribers than I do, so uh, maybe you should talk to him. All right, he's the, he's the YouTube popular guy. He's legit. Uh, it's the Qing Dynasty. Uh, well, yeah, now that it is also part of the Ming Dynasty as well, um, or the Yuan Dynasty, because the White Lotus Society was the Ming, 
And then when the Qing took over, the White Lotus Society was Ming again, and they tried to, uh, you know, establish the Ming Dynasty once more. So yeah, you're right. It does. It's in there twice. So, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, so we can get going, and I won't keep you, you know, you know, too long today. Um, you know, you guys have been working hard, and I do appreciate that. And those of you who have not sent me your uh, DBQs from the other day, please, please do. Um, I, I can't stress to you how important it is for you to know where you are sitting in relation to how this how this DBQ is going to take place on uh, May 21st at 1 o'clock. Um, you know, you need to know, you need to get used to what is expected in the new rubric, and it's just good practice. You know, we're going to do it all over again on uh, Monday with another DBQ. And it doesn't take me long to grade these because they're a lot shorter. And uh, all I have to do is, you know, fill this sheet out for you and, you know, and just take a picture of it and send it to you. Uh, those of you from, um, you know, Haltum, if you came in and you know, saw it. I don't know if you did or not. Uh, please, I'd be more than happy to look at your DBQs as well. All right. So please, please take that, take care of that. And do not spend any more than 45 minutes on that DBQ. Okay. You need to get used to that timing. I don't need you out there researching. I don't need you out there making it look perfect. Just do it because that's what it's going to be like on exam day. You just have to do it. You're not going to have time to be go looking to looking up a lot of different stuff. All right. So keep that in mind. All right. So we're going to move from land based empires. You know what we talked about Russia, China, the Ottomans, the Safavids, uh, the Mughals or the Mughals, however that is pronounced. Uh, and we're going to move to what we call the ocean-based, maritime, sea-based uh, empires. And this is where we start to see Europe becoming a very huge force in uh, world history. You know, they've always been there, but now they become more powerful than any nation uh, that has occurred before, especially, you know, when you think about the Chinese and the Mongols, you know, and off to, uh, you know, South Asia as well. So today we're going to take a look at the question we're going to answer today is how do cross-cultural interactions spread technology and facilitate changes in trade and travel from 1450 to 1750? College board loves trade. So am I thinking the DBQ is going to be on trade? I don't know. Um, I think that there's going to be some sort of trade, you know, some sort of trade bit to it because that covers a huge distance of time. You can talk about trade from 1200 where we start this course all the way to 1900 where we end it this year. So trade has always been one of those things that's a continuity, but it does change and who's in power and all that sort of stuff. And we're going to take a look at uh, that today. All right, so keep that in mind. So behind this innovate, behind this new trade system here, we have technological innovations that take place from 1450 to 1750. Science, right? You know, it's the idea that science really pushes pushes the Europeans forward. And if it isn't because of science, maybe they don't uh, move out as fast or as far as they did. All right, so let's take a look at the development of transoceanic trans trade and, uh, and travel here, all right? So one thing you have to keep in mind too, Europe was never fully isolated from Asia, all right, or South Asia. You know, you had the Silk Road, you had the trade routes of the Mediterranean there, um, and the Trans-Saharan trade routes, so they were in contact. Was it a lot of products being changed back and forth? No, not necessarily, because remember, during the medieval period, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, whatever you want to call it, the Europeans really didn't have a whole lot to trade. All right. And it wasn't until they started venturing out into these new areas do they get things to trade. But they become more active in this Indian Ocean trade network during the 16th century. They also wanted more of an access to Asia. All right. But of course, they have to go through, especially over the land routes, they have to go through Constantinople or, you know, this area right down in here, which after the Ottomans take it over in 1453, it becomes Istanbul. And the, uh, the Europeans are looking for possible new routes to get them to Asia. I mean, they weren't 
definitely looking at finding America. You know, that was not part of the plan. The plan was to go to Asia, to go to South Asia, especially. All right. So in 1492, after the Reconquista of Spain, after the Catholics kicked the Muslims out of Spain, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand hire, um, hire Christopher Columbus to uh, find this new route, to sail west, or to sail, to sail west, to find this possible new route to Asia, all right? But of course, on his western trip here, remember, um, one of the things that you have to remember um, is that Christopher Columbus is Italian, so he did have contract with trade uh, in that area. And with Christopher Columbus, this is the first time that these voyages connected people from the west and the east for the first time. So we see this connection. Here we have the eastern hemisphere. And with Christopher Columbus looking to get over here, actually runs into this area of the world here. All right. Um, and this extensive trade system establishes the maritime empires of Spain, Portugal, Great, uh, Great Britain, France, and Holland. And again, most of this trade was conducted by men. All right. Uh, but in Southeast Asia, there's a little anomaly here. But in Southeast Asia, the Europeans had conducted most of their business with women. All right. The women were the ones who handled the markets in Southeast Asia. They were the ones that handled the money in, you know, changing services in those cultures. So for the most part, trade was from man to man. It was a male dominated industry. Um, but in Southeast Asia, a lot of women took uh, uh, took control of certain aspects of trade. All right. Um, Portugal, Spain, and England were inventing, you know, or excuse me, um, yeah, Spain and England were inventing naval technology of their own. Now, they were aware of the traditions of the Mediterranean, of classical Greece, you know, using the stars to navigate. They were aware of that. They knew that. Um, and they were able to combine new technology, what they came up with, with that of Islamic and Asian sailors. So they were able to take the astrolab and make it maybe make it a little bit better. Took the compass and maybe maybe made it a little bit a little bit better. You know the sailing technology, um, you know that goes along with it. And the leading figure of this uh, new technology uh, was a guy by the name of Prince Henry, and he's called Prince Henry the Navigator. Now he was not royalty. He wasn't a prince, you know, and he really wasn't even a sailor. He was more of an inventor. Um, and he financed expeditions. He really didn't take a whole lot himself, but he financed the expeditions that went around the coasts of, of Africa. And as you can see, those early routes were right along the coast. They always kept land in sight. And it wasn't until later on that with newer technology, they were able to move out into the open ocean and uh, be able to, uh, you know, be successful in that. Um, he had a lot of financial banking or a financial support from his country. So that what's make, that's what makes Portugal uh, the first to really head out into uh, the open ocean here. All right. Um, again, we have the advance in ideas, uh, the knowledge of tides. Uh, help sailors predict the depth of water near the shore so they wouldn't run upon the rocks. Uh, better record keeping on wind direction and intensity helps sailors sail with more confidence. All right, if you know it, you can do it. It's just like writing a DBQ. Once you become comfortable using the techniques that we need to write it, you will do better at it. Same way with early sailing. Once you understand the tides, once you understand the winds, and if you can, uh, you know, create a great, you know, navigational map, uh, you know, cartography, you know, improves here. Astronomical charts helped with the navigation to determine location before. Uh, the use of the compass was widely used. So you first have navigational charts, and then here comes the compass to make it a little bit more precise here. Um, you know, this chart over here to the right is an early navigational chart. And the Chinese were developing these charts, you know, as early as the 5th century BCE. So, you know, the Chinese were way ahead of the Europeans at this time. Another piece of technology that uh, greatly enhanced the Europeans here was 
the ship, all right? These are just different versions of, you know, ships. We have the Caravel, the Redunda, the Carrick, uh, the English Galleas, the English Great Ship, and then the Galleon. And as you can see, they become much larger and the cargo that they can carry becomes much larger. And these, you know, the larger the ship, the better the technology. It will increase long distance trade across the ocean, you know, with the use of updated rudders and astrolabs and gyroscopes and compasses and sails. So you see this new type of, of technology that a lot of this technology that is used comes from uh, the ancient uh, Greeks, uh, the Muslims, and the Asians as well. All right. Okay, so here we are. What are the long-term results of this connection? All right. You get this blending of technology between Europe and Asia, all right, which is going to lead to the rapid expansion of uh, exploration and global trade. Uh, the introduction of gunpowder aided in the conquest abroad for Europeans, all right. You know, one of the things, you know, that they took to the New World with them were guns and, you know, and the Aztecs and the Incas were going, oh, my gosh, these guys are gods because they have these sticks that shoot fire. You know, they didn't understand them. And then they traded guns here in West Africa for slaves. So gunpowder is very, very important here. Um, in North and East Africa, trading cities you know, grew with the introduction of the Europeans here. Uh, naval technology was sought after by people like Peter the Great. He wanted to westernize his trade. He wanted to westernize his navy as well. And of course, he wants to westernize his, you know, his military. All right. So that brings us to the end of our technological innovations here. So not a whole lot, you know, there that you're going to have to remember. But I think most of you have got this. You understand that the technology that is involved with exploration. And this is great information, especially if it is a trading type of DBQ. You can bring this up. Uh, some of you guys brought uh, some of these, these things up in the Portuguese DBQ that we wrote the other day. Uh, you're bringing up the compass, the astrolab, the sails. And guys, that ends, that adds to that evidence beyond documents, okay? So, you know, just keep on doing that and uh, refer back to, you know, this lecture for that type of stuff, all right? So let's take a, uh, you know, a quick, uh, you know, break. I'm going to check, you know, if there's any questions here in the chat. And then uh, we will start on the next one. And let me see here. What will the next one be here? Um... We're going to take a look at causes and <laughs> causes and events. We should probably say causes and effects. And Joa, this uh, PowerPoint is 10 slides long. So if that helps you, great. All right. I'll check back here in a couple of moments. I just want to make sure, you know, I'm checking um, the questions in the comments here. <laughs> yeah. You're right, Nicholas. I said the DBQ was going to be very important. Uh, Bavesh, it's 45 minutes long. What happens if Europe isolated instead of China? I don't know. That's a that's a great question, Kevin. Um, you know, what if the Europeans didn't, you know, move across? What if they had isolated instead of China? Maybe, you know, China would establish colonies, you know, on the west coast of the New World. Uh, you know, there is a theory out there that they actually reached the New World in 1421. Now, it's a little bit wonky when you take a look at it, but it's still the idea is there. Did they have the technology to do it? You bet. But due to Confucianism and things like that, they just decided to pull back and say, you know what, we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to concentrate on uh China itself and not worry about showing off our power out there in the world. Hey, Muhammad, how are you? China would become a ma yeah they would have become a massive superpower that is for sure
All right. Let's get going. All right. Here we go. You guys ready? I hope so. Because I am. I just want to get this thing gone, done, over with. And uh, then we can move on to something else. Uh, but first of all, I need to pull up this PowerPoint on my phone so I can have my notes in front of me. Uh, let me see. Exploration causes. Who's to say they aren't today a superpower? Uh, they have a lot of issues, uh, Mega. Their, uh, their uh, military definitely does not make them a superpower. Do they have nuclear weapons? Yeah, you bet they do. But, you know, our military um, would greatly take care of a um, Chinese military. But what Chinese has, the China, Chinese have over us, over us is just this huge army. We, do, we don't have anything like that. So, all right. All right, let's get going. So exploration causes and events or effects here. You know, it's basically the same thing. What were the causes and the effects of the state-sponsored expansion of maritime exploration? Now, Christopher Columbus has a quote. He said, you can never cross the ocean unless you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. And as I talked about earlier, the technology that was out there at this time allowed them to move away from the shore so they could do this long distance trade. And of course, as you move across this you know, ocean, the idea is to find riches. That's what they wanted, you know, gold and silver and everything that else that comes with it. And of course, you know, it's what we always talk about. And I think you learned this in uh, seventh grade, you know, Texas history. It's the idea of the three G's. They're looking for gold. They're looking for uh, glory. And of course, they're uh, not looking for God. They're looking to spread Christianity. But what were the roles of the states? in this exploration. When I say the role of the state, what was the role of the government? What was the role of the nation here? Of course, here's what we're going to take a look at. You know, so states were looking at different ways to expand their authority and control of resources in this area because they understood resources are very, very important to gaining wealth. If you don't have resources to trade, no one's going to trade with you. And that was what the problem was very early on. You know, when Vasco da Gama and Diaz made their, you know, their early trips to uh, Asia and, and, you know, South Asia has all these exotic spices and textiles and silk and things like that. And they go, okay, what do you have to trade for it? The Europeans go, well, I got this helmet. I've got this pot and this pan, maybe. I got some, uh, I got some flax, you know. Um, and the Indians are going, what are you talking about? These things aren't very cool. You know, I'm not going to trade you for that, you know. So the Europeans understood they needed somewhere to get some luxurious goods, some tradable items. And of course, now Europe is going to become very competitive in this trade market, um, you know, so Europeans are measuring their wealth in how much gold and how much silver uh, they're going to accumulate. And this leads to the economic uh, system of mercantilism or mercantilism here. Um, and it's, you know, it's very, very easy. It's basically you sell as much stuff as much as many goods as you can to other countries. I want to sell you this cup, this pen, you know, this piece of paper, this remote control, you know, I want to sell that to other countries and the other countries are coming to you. Well, I want you to buy, you know, from us and you're kind of going, well, no, I don't want to buy very much from you. You want to maximize your exports and minimize your imports. Hope that makes sense. You want more stuff being sold than what you're buying. That is what mercantilism, mercantilism is all about. It is to create wealth for the country here. Um, so I think it's a very simple thing to, you know, understand here. All right. All right. States. And the interests of explorers were very closely tied to Portugal. Portugal was the first where the state becomes very, very involved in this exploration and this long distance trade. You know, three people led, um, led the uh, exploration of the Portuguese. The first, of course, was Prince Henry the Navigator. He wanted to find this uh, all water route to the east. He wanted African gold. Um, 
in Portugal, and the Portuguese were the first to begin importing African slaves. Um, and this, they did this by sea trade now, and it was beginning to replace the overland slave trade. Uh, Bartholomew Diaz was the first to sail around the southern tip of uh, Africa in 1488. Uh, he didn't fear or he didn't push much further than that uh, because he feared that his crew was going to go into mutiny. They're going, what are you trying to do? You're trying to kill us. We're heading into these unknown waters. So, you know, he basically turned back on his first trip in 1488. And of course, he does make it all the way there about 10 years later in 1498. All right. Um, and then Vasco da Gama, um, Vasco da Gama makes, I should, uh, excuse, Diaz was the first there and he turns around and goes back. Uh, da Gama is the first to go all the way to India there. He landed in India and this was a key step in expanding uh, the influence of the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean uh, trade net. All right, so let's take a look at what happens because of this. All right, so again, I talked about you know, these countries were looking for gold, they're looking for gold, glory, and they're also looking to spread Christianity. That is always a huge thing. Uh, remember, Muslim merchants did it. They expanded Islam uh, by trading in Southeast Asia all along the East Coast of Africa over to India and then basically down to Southeast Asia. You have early Buddhist traders coming out of India and Nepal into China, you know, trading that way. And of course, as they trade, your culture goes with you so you see uh, you see you know certain religions spread because of trade uh, this guy over here Alfonso de Albuquerque in the early uh, 16th century took control of Malacca from Arab traders um, you know and he was a very ruthless guy you know the Indian Ocean trade network before the Portuguese got there was very very peaceful everyone cooperated with each other no one was trying to take control of it until the Europeans came and the Europeans wanted to take control of this and a guy here Alfonso de Albuquerque does that he was he was ruthless after he landed in uh, parts of India, he became a governor in this in this era, and he would send strings of Indians' ears back to Portugal. He would cut off the ears of Indians to show Portugal that, uh, yeah, he was very successful in his conquest of this area of India. Uh, and, you know, Portugal, why were they so successful? Well, they had superior ships, all right? They had better weapons on their ships. They could control both the African and Indian trading coasts. They were ahead of other European, you know, other European nations. And then, of course, after trade, oh, here come the Catholic missionaries. Here come the Jesuits. Remember, the Jesuits come from the Catholic Reformation as they are trying to reform after the Protestant Reformation here. Uh, this guy here, his name is Matteo Ricci. Um, he goes to China and he tries to impress the Chinese with these with new learning and you know he shows these sorts of things to the emperor and the emperor is impressed but he does fail to get a lot of converts here um, at this time China has stopped most of its long distance trade uh, across the seas you know they tended to begin to focus inward they've started to become you know a little bit isolationist here I'm not going to say they went totally isolationist but they do begin to focus inward all right um, what the Europeans wanted to do here they wanted to create a monopoly complete control over the spice trade and to license all of the ships now as you guys have read in that DBQ about the Portuguese it kind of worked really good here um, you know Portugal you know charged ships a fee to trade all right and they create this uh, trading post empire and Portugal never really went out to colonize, okay? They didn't set up colonies. They, ex they established what they call trading posts. They'd rather control small outposts rather than large territories because I think they kind of understood how tough it would be to control some of these large areas of the world. So let's just control the trade area. Let's control these cities like Calicut and we can you know, become wealthy doing that. Um, they also restricted trade to those who were willing to buy permits to trade. You know, if you didn't buy this permit to trade, you weren't allowed to trade. And some of your one of your documents talks about that in that DBQ I gave you. Um, 
But the Portuguese were very vulnerable at this time. Even though they controlled the trade for several decades, they did lack the workers and the ships for enforcement of such a large trading empire. You know, Portugal was tiny. It's right here on the Iberian, you know, peninsula here. Um, it's a very tiny country. Um, and also another part that allowed, that, you know, made them weak was that the Portuguese, a lot of Portuguese Sailors traded independently, ignoring the government. They became corrupt. Uh, you know, government officials are becoming corrupt, which hampers the trading empire. Man, we see this corruption all the time, no matter what country we're in, what time period in. It's always about government corruption and how that, you know, tends to weaken a country. Um, so by the early 17th century, the Dutch and the English are challenging Portugal in this area. Uh, the Dutch is down here in Southeast Asia, and then here come the British. They're here in uh, India as well. Um, so by 1620, uh, the, the uh, Portuguese had traveled all the way to Japan, and uh, they begin to trade with Japan. And of course, with going into Japan, uh, they're going to take their... Uh, you know, missionaries with them. And as we know, that's going to create all sorts of problems here. Um, now, let's talk about the Spanish here a little bit. Uh, the Spanish were the first to circumnavigate the world. All right. Magellan took several ships and he decided, hey, I'm going to sail across the world. And on this, on this uh, sailing trip, he annexed uh, the Philippines, you know, the Philippines are located right over here in Southeast Asia, or Southeast uh, Asia. He gets there and he goes, he plants a flag in the ground. He says, I have a next to you Philippines. You are now part of the Spanish empire. All right. You know, and Manila becomes this huge, you know, trading center, uh, attracts Chinese merchants. I mean, they're really close to China there. Um, and due to this interaction there, you know, many Filipinos become Christian. Now, um, Magellan actually is not the one who makes it all the way around the world. His ships do, but he is not. He is actually killed, um, you know, after traveling about three quarters of the way around in a tribal, uh, in a tribal uh, skirmish on Makatan Island here. Uh, he dropped his anchors in, you know, this on this island, and he met with the local chief, who, after converting to Christianity, persuaded Europeans to assist him in conquering a rival tribe on the neighboring island of Makatan. And in, uh, you know, subsequent fighting, Magellan was hit by a poison arrow, and uh, he was left to die. Hey, look, Magellan's hit. Okay, yeah, we're just going to leave him here and we're going to get the heck out of Dodge. And they run to their ships and they take off, but leaving Magellan, you know, to die on this island. Now, could they have saved him? I don't know. But uh, they weren't going to stick around and try, that is for sure. All right, <clears throat> so the lure of riches here is what draws people to North America, all right? The exploration of the Americas was heightened due to this discovery of the Aztecs and the Incans uh, by the Spanish gold and silver. Uh, and they soon discovered that uh, cash crops like cotton, tobacco, sugar were easily grown in this new world. And heck, if we can enslave the local populations to grow it for us, that's gonna even make it, you know, uh, uh, you know, a lot cheaper. And then, of course, eventually we're going to get African slavery brought over. Um, trade across the Pacific uh, begins to increase. Silver from South America begins making its way into Southeast Asia uh, by large Spanish ships called galleons. They would stop in Manila. Of course, remember, the Philippines had been annexed by the Spanish Empire and silver was traded. And by the uh, 17th century, uh, silver becomes the dominant currency in global trade. People begin to use silver as money all across the world. And a lot of that silver is mined out of South America and also in Japan. And then, of course, all these European nations are looking for this Northwest Passage. And when I say a Northwest Passage, they're looking how to get across North America without having to go around it. So the French look for it, the English look for it, the Dutch look for it. And of course, no one is successful in finding this Northwest Passage. All right. All right, let's take a look at French exploration. Now, the French 
end up coming, you know, to the north there, uh, and they, you know, establish establish colonies and trading posts and fur trading posts in um, in Canada there. Um, you know, they begin to realize that there's a lot of resources in the Americas, furs, timber, because uh, they don't really find a lot of gold in this area up here. Um, they found the trading city of Quebec. It becomes a huge trading city. Uh, they set up schools and churches to convert Native Americans to Catholicism, of course, and they explore the Great Lakes. And then eventually they go down and they explore the... Uh, you know, Mississippi River, there is a town, you know, two towns uh, in Iowa. One town in Iowa is named Marquette after one of the explorers. And then there's a town in Illinois named Joliet because of these early explorers. So they go all the way down to the, uh, down to the Gulf of Mexico there and establishing, you know, the port of New Orleans. That is a French city. Um, now the French typically didn't settle permanently. All right. They traded with Native Americans and they tended to have better relations with the Native Americans. They didn't treat them as badly as, say, maybe the the English did. All right. Uh, all right. So let's take a look at the English. Um, the English, again, set sail in 1497. Hey, let's go look for that Northwest Passage. And of course they fail. So early in the 16th century, the English could not compete with the Spanish naval power yet. So their early claims in the Americas extended from Newfoundland, Canada, you know, in this area over here, down to Chesapeake Bay in the New England area there. But by 1588, the English defeat the Spanish, you know, Spanish Armada in this huge naval battle. And uh, England then proclaims itself, hey, we beat them. So now we're this huge naval power. And they begin competing for land and resources, of course, in the Americas. By 1607, Jamestown in Virginia is settled. And it becomes the first successful colony in the New World, you know, set up by the English. All right. And then uh, let's take a look at Dutch um, Dutch exploration here. You know, Henry Hudson, again, looking for that famous Northwest Passage, doesn't exist. So he basically stops off here in this part of the world. And uh, he goes to uh, the island of Manhattan, you know, where Manhattan Island is, New York City is today. Uh, and he calls it New Amsterdam. And you're probably wondering, well, wait a minute, I thought that was an English colony. Well, eventually it will become an English colony. Um, Hudson is able to purchase Manhattan Island from the Native Americans for about 24 bucks. All right. That's all it cost the Dutch to purchase Manhattan Island. Um, so let me let me see here. In a letter written by a Dutch merchant uh, to the directors of the Dutch East India Company, um, he says Manhattan was purchased for 60 guilders worth of trade. All right. Which is about approximately a thousand dollars in today's dollars. All right. So New Amsterdam becomes this important trading center for the Dutch. Furs, crops, tobaccos all make their way through uh, New Amsterdam, of course. And uh, they sent these goods to the Netherlands in exchange for manufactured goods that they sold in North America. Again, that is what, you know, mercantilism is about. All right, so that brings us up on, uh, or finishes up with causes and effects of exploration. And the next thing we're going to get into is the Columbian Exchange. I know you know a lot about it, so it probably won't take that long. So I'll uh, give you a couple of minutes to rest and then we'll carry on. All right. Hope everyone is doing well. I hope you're staying caught up on this. I know I'm kind of going fast, um, but uh, we'll get it done here. All right. One last one today, and then I will get out of your hair. And let me see, Joa, eight slides. All right, that's where we are. And let me get into my drive. And there we go. 
Let me go refresh my coffee and then we will get started. I email the DBQ to you. Oh, yeah, most definitely, uh, Samaya. Email me what you have. Uh, that $24 was back then. It was about $1,000 today of that for what they uh, uh, what they paid for it. You wish inflation didn't exist? Well, Elaine, if inflation didn't exist, you wouldn't get very much money. That's for sure because your dollar would buy more. So uh, if you like to have a lot of dollars then you need to have inflation. If you don't want inflation, then you don't need a lot of dollars. Does that make sense to you? All right. Yes, coffee, coffee, coffee. Yes, most definitely. This fuels my day. Okay, let's get going. So we can get you back to whatever you need to do. All right. So here we are. We're going to talk about the Colombian Exchange. And again, I think... You know, many of you already know what this is, but, you know, it's it's good to cover it, all right? Uh, so what are we going to talk about today? So what were the causes of the Columbian Exchange and the effects on the Eastern and Western Hemisphere? So here we're talking causes and effects. And, of course, you know, this is the new connection between the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere and the products, the things that went from one side of the world to the other, all right, so you get this crossing of things. Now, <clears throat> one thing I want to keep you to let you know, okay, and this is very, very important, all right, and you might want to write this in your notes, okay? So a few years ago, there was a trade essay that the kids had to write for the AP exam. It all had to do with trade, 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 trade. And some kids brought up the Colombian Exchange as a trade network. No, the Colombian exchange is not trade, all right? The Colombian exchange is, hey, I'm going to take some uh, disease and it's going to be put over in the new world. That's exchanging it, okay? Hey, look, they're growing tomatoes and potatoes here. I'm going to grab some of these and I'm going to take them back to the old world. That is exchange. They're not trading things for one thing for another here. The Colombian exchange is not trade. Does it lead to trade? You bet. But the Colombian exchange in and of itself is not trade. And I hope you guys understand that. All right. Okay, here we go. Get back into my phone here. And all right. So one of the things, of course, that's a Paula part of the Colombian exchange is that diseases and population catastrophe. Remember that the New World had been isolated from Europe. They had never been in contact with each other. So their immunity is not, you know, designed to protect them from old world diseases. They had no exposure to that at all. Um, you know, horses, you know, had been extinct for hundreds of years in the New World. And here come the Europeans with horses here, all right? So the conquistadors. Now remember, a little bit of history on the conquistadors. Why is it that conquistadors come to the New World? Remember, in Europe, the, the idea of inheritance went to the oldest son. All right? So father dies, all the land goes to the oldest son. Well, I'm the second son in my family. If, the, if all that land went to my older brother, Jay, what am I going to do if I'm, if I'm a Spanish uh, guy? Well, I'm going to go try to find my own riches on, you know, somewhere else. Those who were the conquistadors, they were looking for wealth. They were looking for power. They were looking for glory because they knew their options were very, very limited in the old world. All right. So you have, you know, people like Pizarro and Cortez, and these guys bring smallpox and measles, influenza and, and malaria to the new world here. Not COVID, uh, <laughs> but they bring these other things. And the population in some areas fall 50% in some areas, and some lost up to 90%. On the island of, of Hispaniola, where Christopher Columbus lands, 
you know, the Tayano people, you know, I don't even know if the Tayano uh, people even exist to this day because of, of you know, the decimation that came because of, uh, you know, old world diseases. All right. So, you know, germs are the only things that go, you know, aren't the only things that go back across, you know, uh, just so uh, you know. So, you know, going to the new world, you get, you know, measles and smallpox and malaria, blah, blah, blah. Did any diseases make their way back to Europe? Yeah, syphilis did. But again, that's one of those diseases that you can control the spread of that. You know, it takes certain actions to cause syphilis where measles and malaria and smallpox is just coming into contact with people like COVID. All right. So yeah, there is a little disease that goes back to Europe, but it doesn't decimate the population of Europe like those other diseases do in the new world. All right. You know, crops and livestock are exchanged. You know, cattle, pig, pigs, wheat and grapes come from the east, you know, and this is a great, great, uh, you know, image on what goes across that comes from the east to the new world. Uh, the horse, you know, the horse, oh no, that looks like a goat. Um, the horse here makes its way to North America. And just think about what the horse does for uh, the Native American culture. You know, they become horse cultures. They depend on the horse for buffalo. Um, and then going back across to the New World, and I always bring this up, you know, the tomato is very, very important. Think about your favorite Italian food. It has tomato-based sauces. Pizza has tomato-based pizza sauce. If it wasn't for this connection of the Colombian Exchange and the tomato being brought back to Europe, we might not have certain foods. The potato here will eventually raise the population of Europe. And then of course it will decimate the population of Europe later in Ireland with the Great Potato Famine in the mid 19th century, all right? So a lot of this food going back and forth, especially the food going from the Americas to Europe leads to this huge population growth in, you know, in Europe. All right. This is this this one here is where trade comes into this. All right. Um, we have plantations being constructed over in the New World. OK, they're growing sugar, they're growing tobacco and cotton in southeast, you know, the southeast part of North America. Sugar here, definitely sugar here. Rice was also grown in this part of the world and you need you need um, a labor force. Well, of course, you know, we initially, and we'll get into this later on, you have the Native Americans that are forced into this labor. And in another lecture, I'll talk about those, you know, what those types of labor uh, systems were called. But, you know, just to get through here, these sugar tobacco plantations, these cash crops, uh, you needed workers to work on them. And this is where the transatlantic slave trade comes in. So you need you know, slaves to the Americas and you trade for them. You trade textile, rum, manufactured goods to Africa, guns. You know, you trade that here. The slaves go to America and then sugar, tobacco and cotton are sent back over to Europe for manufacturing. And then, of course, we know that sugar, one of the byproducts of sugar production is rum. And then that rum is taken down here to Africa to sell for slaves. So you see, you know, this triangle trade or the Atlantic trade. Uh, and the conditions on these boats, the middle passage, this is called the middle passage. It was just horrible. Uh, you know, five to 10 percent of the slave population was lost um, on the voyage, you know, every year. Only six percent of the slaves were taken to British North America. Most of the slaves went here. All right, because the living conditions, and I'm not saying that the living conditions were great in, you know, North America, but they were much better than what you have in, uh, you know, South America. Now, the Africans brought their culture with them, too. They brought okra and rice to the Americas. So we see, you know, some cultural uh, things and cuisine uh, taking place. Now, this is a great graphic here of, you know, whenever you get a chance, you want to relook at this, take a picture of this. Uh, these are just some of the things that are exchanged back and forth, um, you know, and we have what the examples are. And then we have the effects, 
You know, what happens because of this exchange? You know, all these animals, you get overgrazing by cattle and sheep leads to soil erosion, uh, the spread of diseases from mosquitoes, rats and livestock. People are exchanged. You get racial diversity, which is always good. But then, you know, you always get chattel slavery and then social structures based on race and ethnicity. And we'll get into that in a later, uh, you know, lecture. And then you have the spread of diseases uh, that are taking place. So I highly suggest for you to really take a look at this uh, you know, this portion of the PowerPoint, you know, after, you know, this is all said and done today. All right. You know, another thing that comes up here is, you know, um, other products, you know, that are exchanged west. Now, I forgot to mention, this is east to west. This is coming from the old world to the new world. All right. And then this next slide, whoops, this next slide is Western Hemisphere, what they took back to the Eastern Hemisphere. And I'd already talked about some of this stuff here. Um, you know, syphilis increases health risk in, in uh, uh, Europe here. All right, so what, what is the effect of the Africans in the Americas, okay? Um, you know, the African culture is not lost once it reaches uh, the Americas. Uh, during what we call the African diaspora, the movement of a large group of people out of their native area to a new area. You know, it's very similar to the Jewish diaspora. Uh, the Jews weren't forced. They were never forced into slavery like the Africans. So I'm not trying to lessen, but it is this, you know, it's the same thing. Large groups of people moving from a native country to their to another country, whether it's voluntary or in this case, in the Africans, it was forced, all right? A lot of their culture is retained. Um, you know, the thing that isn't really retained here is languages here, all right? Uh, there wasn't a lot of, I should say, a lot of commonality in uh, languages here due to the linguistic isolation of Africa. You know, certain tribes were in different areas and their languages didn't mis mix a whole lot. So there was not a common African language that came across with the slaves. Um, and when they did come across, the language would combine with European languages in some uh, areas and Creole, like down in New Orleans, it's created with an African language combining with a French language. Uh, music was brought with them um, and it helps them cope with the harsh living environments that they're put in. And the musical styles of the Africans uh, influence a lot of different kinds of music we have in America today, you know, like gospel, jazz, rock, uh, hip hop, uh, food, along with rice and okra, knowledge of how to cook it was brought and prepare these foods. And you get, you know, a very delicious dish called gumbo. So it's the idea that there was forced migration they bring their culture with them. They do not leave it behind and totally, you know, incorporate themselves into a brand new culture. No, you bring it with them. It's what makes you comfortable. All right. And I think, yes, this is our last slide here. Um, when Europeans came to the New World, they intended to use the land more intensely than Native Americans. They cut down trees to clear for growing crops. Uh, so this causes, you know, uh, deforestation and soil depletion. Um, and Europeans lived in more densely populated communities, which puts a strain on water resources and other resources. Native Americans spread out. They were more nomadic. So they didn't strain the environment. Um, so the Europeans begin that here in the New World. All right, so that's our environmental and demographic impact. That brings us to the end of uh, my lecture today. I hope you guys were able to stick around. It looks like most of you are still here. 46, um, you know, was basically where we started with today. And I do appreciate your time and all the work that, uh, you know, we're doing here in this era of uh, sheltering in place and staying at home and being bored a lot of the time. But I encourage you, please, please stay focused. We've got about five weeks before the AP exam. Uh, we are going to practice more DBQ. So don't think I'm, you know, I'm going to give up on that. So I need your best effort on those. And I need you to ask me questions. Okay. Because I don't know. I can see your reading and I can, I can see what you're writing and I can kind of comment on that. But if you don't understand it, please let me know. All right. You guys take care. Stay safe. Stay sane. I miss you and I love you. And I hope we can get back together this year. But uh, if we don't, uh, you know what? We're going to get through this. All right. Have a good one, guys.